Welcome to our brand new series, The Science of Creation According to Laws of Absolute Nature, where we will attempt to provide a timeline from the beginning of time, matter and space of this reality, and the various creations within reality across the boundless universes which pertain to humanity and the interaction between physical and spiritual forces within this realm. In this webisode, we seek to introduce you to the science of creation and carbon organic cosmology. Cosmology is a branch of physics and metaphysics dealing with the nature of the universe and of the cosmos. The term cosmology was first used in English in 1656 in Thomas Blunt's Glossographia and in 1731 taken up in Latin by German philosopher Christian Wolff in Cosmologia Generalis. Religious or mythological cosmology is a body of beliefs based on mythological, religious, and esoteric literature and traditions of creation myths and eschatology. We will begin by overstanding the precepts introduced by the author of Fur Noo Noo known as Baba Tum Ray in regards to his transcript of absolute nature, which explained the idea of a supreme being that encompasses all space, matter, and time and also explained that this being is omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient, and that it is the source of all gods and goddesses mentioned throughout the sacred records throughout the realm. We also delve into the nature of the carbon organic gods and goddesses, describing them as interconnected and interdependent, and explain the five main levels of gods and goddesses found within absolute nature. Additionally, we emphasize the importance of truth and knowledge in understanding the absolute nature of things, highlighting that people need to know their origins and the laws of nature to survive and live in peace and harmony with each other. As well as the work introduced by Afur Noo Noo, also known as Baba Tum Re, we will also incorporate the works of T. Owens more The Science of Minalin and begin with an introduction from the African Genesis by Ishikamusa Barashango who emphasizes the significance of understanding carbon organics true history, which has been deliberately obscured by colonizers and enslavers. Dr. Chancellor Williams argues that carbo-organic civilizations was fully developed and mature in the areas later called Sudan and Egypt, while Dr. John Henry Clark highlights how history has been rewritten to erase carbon organic contributions on all the various continents melaninated people resided. Finally, in this introduction, we will extract an excerpt from the book The Akan, Other Africans, and the Serious Mystery by Kwame Adapa, as it best reflects the level and depth of content we will be addressing, which is often avoided by many carbon organic scholars. The best way to introduce and convey this journey is from the book African Genesis by Ishikamusa Barashango. Dr. Chancellor Williams boldly affirms, the greatest of all issues is right here in a genuine agreement that at the very earliest period known to mankind an African civilization in the areas later called Sudan and Egypt was fully developed with all the arts of civilized life already mature. It's beginning being placed so far into the early history of the world, it is beyond the reach of man. The reason why this information is not common knowledge to the masses of black people is because we are at war. The enemies of the world have been and are still concealing much of the rich, priceless treasures of our true history in an effort to keep us in a perpetual state of mental, spiritual, and economic enslavement. Dr. John Henry Clark reminds, it is too often forgotten when Europeans emerged and began to extend themselves into the broader world of Africa and Asia during the 15th and 16th centuries they went on to colonize most of mankind. Later, they would colonize world scholarship, mainly the writing of history. History was being written or rewritten to show or imply that Europeans were the only creators of what could be called a civilization. In order to accomplish this, the Europeans had to forget or pretend to forget all they previously knew about Africa. Dr. Maulana Karenga reinforces this reality. In fact, Europe declared that the more history you have, the more human you are and then set out to claim all relevant history and deny blacks any. It is a fundamental fact that only humans have history and when Europe could claim without effective challenge during slavery and the colonization of African peoples and lands that blacks had no history, they could and did also claim blacks were not human. For to be denied historical achievement is to be placed outside of humanity, for only humans make history. The need then became one of rescuing and reconstructing black history as a basis for and contribution to the rescue or reconstruction of black humanity. To feed this ferocious dragon of hybrid albino supremacy, the European world is motivated its captains of industry, 
moguls in the financial arena, and the shakers and movers of other segments of society to funnel many millions of dollars into both areas of study and research, which can be interpreted in such a way as to buttress the inflated self-concept i.e. archaeology, anthropology, linguistics, and other related fields. Because these disciplines give definition and cultural context to everything else in the world, European scholars out to dominate these fields and recast their findings in the image of the hybrid Asian albino. However, the historical reality of the carbon organics referred to as the black race's original place in the ancient world managed to survive through every effort to smother it in a variety of confusion. Among the ranks of Eurocentric thinkers, the prevailing racist theories of history create a very real dilemma how, in view or civilization's beginnings in the land of the blacks, to explain their role in world history. Having successfully degraded carbon organics throughout the world and supported the degradation with their science and religion, how now explain that this same carbon organic race was the first builders of the very civilization of which the hybrid albino themselves are heirs? Most of hybrid albino's academia responded to this dilemma in the usual stiff necked irrational manner. They simply deny compelling evidence of these African high culture civilizations by claiming them as their own. Therefore, as Dr. Carter G. Woodson so clearly points out in his book, The Miseducation of the Negro, the large majority of the African people educated in the Western world have only been taught about what other races, Europeans in particular, have done, and that the only way we can ever be somebody is to imitate them, instead of imitating ourselves, thus denying the reality of our own existence. Dr. Sheik Diop says the climate of alienation finally deeply affected the personality of the Negro, especially the educated black who had an opportunity to become conscious of world opinion about him and his people. He often happened that the Negro intellectual loses confidence in his own possibilities and of those of his race to such an extent that, despite the validity of the evidence presented, it will not be astonishing. If some of us are still unable to believe that blacks really played the earliest civilizing role in the world. When people are robbed of vital life given knowledge of their own true history, they become lost and stray from the path of the high calling and holy purpose of a unique existence, for the spark that gives life meaning and purpose has been hidden from them. Consequently, the attitude of many of today's enlightened black youth towards our history is, who cares about what happened back there in the past, all that is important is what's happening to me now. Surely only a people suffering from an acute loss of his or her memory can produce children who would deny their own historical relevance. Dr. Asa G. Hilliard observes, an individual that loses his or her memory is disabled. So it is with a people, African and African diaspora people have in large measure been deprived of the most important memories of history. Those who have enslaved and colonized Africans have understood fully the powerful role that history plays in the life of people. The creation stories of Kush and Kemet were told and retold many times in many ways and in many places. One of the first areas to be colonized by the Comitians was Sumer in the land between the two rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates, which the indigenes called Chaldea and the Greeks referred to as Mesopotamia presently known as the southern portion of Iraq. Somewhere between 10,000 and 5,000 BCE, a contingent of Kushite Commissions led an expedition there and established a colony, which eventually blossomed into the Sumerian Empire. According to recent archaeological rediscoveries, Commission agriculture sciences transplanted crop growing and harvesting techniques along with animal husbandry to that location 10,000 BCE. Renowned Africanologist Dr. John G. Jackson, quoting Dr. H. R. Hall of the Department of Egyptian and Assyrian Antiquities of the British Museum reports, the Sumerian culture springs into our view ready-made. We have no knowledge of the time when the Sumerians were savages. When we first meet with them, in the 4th millennium BC, they are already a civilized metal using people living in great and populous cities. Possessing a complicated system of writing and living under the government of firmly established civil and religious dynasties and hierarchies. Drusilla Houston asked the question, what was the original race of the Sumerians? W.E.B. Du Bois answers, before the year 4000 BC, there is evidence that Negroid Dravidians and Mongoloid Sumerians ruled in Southern Asia and Asia Minor and in the valley of the Tigris Euphrates. Negroids followed them under Sargon, and Sargon boasted that he commanded all the blackheads and ruled them. 
Renoko Rashidi adds, the Sumerians did after all call themselves the black-headed people and their most powerful and pious people, such as Gadia of Lagash, consistently chose very dark and preferably black stone for their statuary representations. There is also no doubt that the oldest or most exalted Sumerian deity was Anu, a name that loudly recalls the thriving and widely spread black civilizers found at history's dawn in Africa, Asia, and even Europe. Houston says, overlapping of the genealogy of antiquity serves to unite the Chaldeans with the old race of the Upper Nile as does their building the Temple of Anu, another name of the original Kushite family. Dio corroborates, the first Mesopotamian civilizations were Black, Elam, and Susa, it must not be forgotten, were Black cities. But the movement was out of Egypt, the Egyptian influence spread throughout all of Western Asia. Jackson assures us that the Sumerian stories of their origins definitely points to Egypt and Ethiopia as the original homeland. The myths, legends, and traditions of the Sumerians definitely points to Africa as the original home of the Sumerians. Sir Henry Rawlinson called these people Kushite. Chancellor Williams notes the legend what became of the black people of Sumer the traveler asks the old man, for ancient records show that the people of Sumer were black. What happened to them the old man sighed they lost their history, so they died. Just about every carbon organic ethnic group is connected to the Sirius system in one way or another. These can be found in their legends, their language, and their culture. Carbon organic tribes, families, and clans and wider humanity have been lucky to learn from great shamans and sages such as Credo Mudwa, Maladoma Sum, the Dogon priesthood, as well as many unknown wise men and women, sages, and elders of carbon organic heritage. Since Einstein's relativity theory, it has been known and accepted that matter is a form of energy, a coagulation, or condensation of energy. In this light, the material universe is basically a hierarchy of energies at different orders of density. Our senses have some access to the densest forms of energy, which is matter. The hierarchy of energies are interrelated, and the level below it sustains each level, this hierarchy of energies was identified with the Netaru in ancient Egypt, where visible condensed energies and invisible uncondensed energy realities were understood as aspects of a single scheme of energy. This hierarchy of energies came as a result of the initial act of creation and the subsequent effects of the Big Bang that created the universe. All created parts of the universe are energies. Each minute particle of everything is in constant motion, i.e. energized according to the kinetic theory. In other words, everything is animated or energized. Animals, trees, rocks, birds, even the air, sun, and moon. Energy was, is, and continues to be both the cause and effect. It is a prerequisite to action and is emitted as a byproduct of every act. The world's basic energy, the energy that animates the universe, is what ancient Egyptians refer to as Nu, the original state of the universe. All throughout Sub-Sahara Africa, you find the same term Nu. The Monde-speaking people of West Africa speak of Nyama, energies, an ancient Egyptian term Nu meaning life force and Amma means matrix, the universal hierarchy of energies. This hierarchy of energies is set up neatly into a vast matrix of deeply interfaced natural laws within absolute law. It is both natural and mystical. This energy matrix also provides a system of cause and effect that binds a society to its morals. Each one of us must know how to manage these Nyama energies within and around ourselves. Nyama energy is in everything, including all the forces, desires, emotions, etc. within each of us. Social laws must follow the same pattern of the energy organization of the universe as above, so below. In concentrations, especially when they are massive and uncontrolled, this energy matrix is potentially dangerous, even deadly. Being hyperactive or angry or human examples of uncontrolled and massive energies. It is therefore of paramount importance for the energy matrix to be controlled. Only learned guardians can manipulate and control this matrix without upsetting the balance. Thus we have an explanation of the forces at work in the social and natural world that encourages a cautious disposition and restraint in all areas of life. 
In addition to the Mande-speaking people of West Africa and their recognition of the new energy, most African societies have a similar application since they all perceive the whole universe as basically an energy matrix. Ancient Egyptian and other African societies regard the world as a product of a complex system of relationships among people living and dead, animals, plants, and supernatural phenomena. This rationale is often called animism because its central premise that all things are animated or energized by life forces. Many call these invisible energies in the universe spirits. Spirits are therefore numerous. These invisible entities inhabit certain areas or are associated with particular natural phenomena. Spirit or energies exist in family type groups, i.e. they are related to each other, but are also capable of taking human, animal, plant, or any form. Nothing prevents a form of energy or spirit to reside in anything. As human beings who are born and later die, one can rationalize that the spirit energy matrix and interrelated energy group that entered the human body made of matter to animate it and bring it to life at birth and can later vacate the matter and go to another place and can likewise dwell in any other object for any length of time. Ancestor importance is based on an almost universal belief in the persistence of the human soul after death. A man who lives to a good old age has a vigorous soul which translates to the next world with its spiritual power. This power system protects his family lineage. He is the intermediary between his family and unknown forces that control the universe. When he leaves the world, he must therefore be sent off with due respect and properly equipped with all that he may require. Part of his property, which was energized by spirit whilst on earth, is buried with him in the grave. Spirits being energy and energy matrices can be either good or evil, and both have great power over the living. Therefore, the people are or were concerned with keeping away the bad and propitiating the friendly spirits. This concern led to the development of special groups or priests to provide the training and to exercise such powers of communication. Our modern society admits that we only use about 5% of our mental capacity. Many use much more because they are aware and able to tap into the invisible energies around us by interacting with the universe through its many components. When the supreme creative forces of this galaxy set about creating and maintaining the galaxy, hierarchies of nature spirits were placed within the planets, solar systems, and stars of the galaxy which we will refer to as guardians. These nature spirits or guardians range from the simple elemental beings to extremely advanced consciousness responsible for entire multi-star systems. The pulses from the supreme creative forces come from the center of the galaxy, but the most advanced groups of consciousness in the galaxy can be found inhabiting the central stars, etc. The purpose of creating a galaxy is to allow diverse beings from all over the realms of existence to have experiences in physicality. These beings incarnate in physical body vehicles and different star systems to have unique experiences that allow learning to take place. These incarnated beings in different systems have become known as the various extraterrestrial groups in order to supervise the hierarchies of nature spirits as well as to watch over and provide guidance to the incarnate beings in the various star systems. The galaxy creators created a third group of beings. These beings were here right from the start, even before physical incarnations of extraterrestrial groups began in the various star systems. These beings are the ones called the Guardians or Netaru, the maintenance crew. Their specific purpose is to maintain creation as the supreme creative forces at the center of the galaxy have set it out. It is well to mention that it is through the guardian beings that the great beings at the center of the galaxy, if they want to incarnate into their creation, the galaxy for whatever purposes, incarnate through. The guardians are neither nature spirits nor regular extraterrestrials, rather they are like something in between. They are the mediators. They enforce the rules of creation as set up by the supreme creative forces. They exist in various forms. Some are completely non-physical or etheric slash energetic. Some are semi-physical, and some are physical with the ability to transmute their vehicles from physical to energetic, energetic, and back to physical. Many have androgynous physical bodies. This is the perfect vehicle for the spirit, which is in itself, androgynous being a perfect balance between male and female aspects in order to incarnate in. There are different kinds of guardians, celestial guardians, solar guardians, and planetary guardians. 
These three groups break down into subgroups. The celestial guardians tend to be non-physical or energetic. The solar guardians tend to be at their most semi-physical, and the planetary guardians are often physical or physical to semi-physical. All systems in this galaxy are maintained and evolved in one form or another by guardians. Our solar system, or sun in fact, has links with stars in both the Pleiadian and Syrian star constellations as well as other star systems. It is claimed by those who channel and it is also found in ancient evidence and carbon organic cosmology, writings and sacred ancient mystery schools that we will evidence and present in later webisodes, that the guardians of the Pleiadian system are based on bird slash avian beings, whilst the guardians of the Sirius system are primarily based on feline beings. There are also mixtures between the guardian families, so there are some planetary guardians, for instance, who are mixtures between feline and avian. The feline beings are said to be primarily connected with the principle of electricity, the masculine principle. For that reason, their purpose is to create, to create new races, to create new forms. The feline beings represent the fire principle. The avians are connected with electromagnetic principle, the balance between electricity and magnetism. For that reason, their purpose is to balance and to work with dimensional portals, vortices, which are created as a result of the interplay between electric and magnetic principles. There are also guardians associated with the magnetic principle. It is said that cetacean beings are based on these kind of guardians. There are also mixtures among the guardian families. On planet Earth, the original human being that was seeded by the felines was a planetary guardian. We can call this being an Earth Guardian. It was originally native to the Pleiadian system, but it was mixed with another Guardian being native to the Syrian system. The physical body of the ancient Earth human was androgynous and its DNA was based on a 12-strand imprint, allowing for access to the dimensional portals of this planet, the solar system, and beyond. The main point here is that the two systems Sirius and Pleiades are important to the history of this planet and also to the native peoples of this planet precisely because of a link to the history of the guardian beings. For carbon organic tribes, families and clans referred to as Africans or Blacks, the important system is Sirius although Pleiades has its place. For other native peoples such as original carbon organic Native Americans and Maori, it is the Pleiades system that is more important. For yet other native people it may be a mixture of both systems. The interesting fact is that these two systems in particular, although they have guardian beings, also have regular extraterrestrials who have influenced the history of this planet as well. The path which has led to the evolution of humanoids has been repeated many times in many ways in our galaxy, and while the ancestors who begin the journey, whether they be reptilian, insectoid, humanoid, feline or avian are of different forms, often the paths are nearly identical in their content. Before we go further into the physical evolution of the many species throughout the boundless galaxies that have influenced the path of humanity over millennia, we will focus within our next several webisodes on the importance of having an overstanding of the universal nine ether energy matrix, from whence it came in the manifestation through the ethers by way of vibrational tones and frequencies from the quantum realm to atoms to atoms. Make sure to subscribe and hit notifications for our next webisode entitled An Introduction to the Absolute Law of the Nature of Nature.